Hello viewers, I'm SB and welcome back to Citizen Sleeper, where today we're given we're given Bliss and Moritz one more chance. Not Bliss specifically, I, I have no beef with Moritz. <laughs> Moritz is fine regardless of how all this works out. Uh, and we certainly rolled the dice today to be able to handle whatever we come across up here. Probably. It's a tangled solar yacht. I guess these are like sails then? Indeed they are. The selected launch window for the Starward Vector's maiden voyage is closing. This is going to be a tight one. I don't know, that's six days. Uh, so obviously, the experimental sail deployment failed horribly. The sails were just kind of all over the place. Yeah, this is, this is fixable. Probably this is fixable. So is this the same deal? It is not, actually. These are both repeatable actions. So one of them costs us energy if we fail it. The other one lowers the amount that the thing is rigged but also is a is an interface action instead of an engineer. Uh, well, a five is perfectly safe over here, so we may as well use it over here. This is, this is gonna be a lot of dice. <laughs> no matter how we do this, this is gonna be a lot of dice. Uh, so we could throw all of the fours and the five, or and the three, into patch solar sails as it is. I have enough scrap to still have five dice tomorrow. We don't need to worry about energy today. Yeah, I think that's... We should, we should probably do this. Let's see what the neutral result is. It bothers me that we have no idea, um, but it's probably not negative, right? Who knows? Maybe we'll get lucky and we'll, we'll get all positives. The spurs need resetting, system needs rebooting. This is all easy. Okay, neutral is still plus two. That rules. You run the system's diagnostics, diagnostics, each time shifting a spur a little more. This is working, but you have to be careful. Okay, two neutrals and a positive. That's fine. And then this, this has a chance of failure, though. And that I think I, I am not interested in allowing... So let's just go ahead and make this an engineer check. We will get at least a neutral result. Okay, one and one, that's actually totally fine. We still don't even need to eat. So we spend our whole cycle just realigning these sails and don't even actually get halfway. But it's, it's very doable from here. Now that said, I think we are on a little bit of a time crunch as far as, um, as far as that person who is probably coming to kill us. So the the Fang situation will be resolved tomorrow. We can check that out. Yeah, things are getting a little tight. We don't know exactly what's going to happen when I finish this. There's probably more events in that storyline, right? Because we just, I feel like we just met Lem and Mina. And the thing is still growing. Three days on that, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven days total on this. It's a little terrifying, a little tiny bit. You know, I feel, I do feel a little silly. I should absolutely have re-rolled when we were just down to the three. Oh, well. Okay. Let's start by going to talk to Fang. Well, I mean, talk to, I hope, I sure hope it's Fang. Fang grins at you as the bay door slides open. I have never been so happy to see this asshole who I halfway hate. He's just, you know, he's just very focused. It's fine. I don't actually dislike him. Above, in the rest of the building, people are busy and frightened. They speak in hushed tones and organize endless meeting after endless meeting. Haven Inch have avoided a full-blown crisis for now, but change is coming. Fang is in good spirits and bundles you inside before you even have the chance to greet him. That was the slickest operation this station has ever seen, he hugs you firmly. You made my job easy, he shakes you by the shoulders. I'm so proud. 
And, he smiles, I got to watch through the cameras as the Haven and security that weren't in on it assaulted the station. Fang smiled. One of them straight up whacked Harden with their pistol. It was beautiful. Okay, and what, what are they going to do with him? I'm not sure anyone knows, but he is cooperating in dismantling his operation and scaring off Conway. Yeah, maybe they'll exile him when they're done, or hand him over to some core authority. Fang, sh Fang shrugs. Now I know he won't be an issue, I'm going to be focusing on systems for a bit. He shakes his head, you know, seeing as that's my actual job. He points to, he points to the ceiling. Uh, the people upstairs weren't so happy, though. They've been fielding questions about the state of the eye right and left since the recording got out. People are scared. Yeah, well, I'm not surprised. Yeah, this whole thing hasn't won me many fans in this administration. But I think in the end they'll agree that outing Harden was worth it. Whatever the methods. He touches a stack of hardware. The eye is old, and it was never meant to run like this. The master control points that Erlen and Havenage installed, they keep it spinning from the rim. That is not ideal. But if you're asking me if the eye will stop spinning next cycle, no. He smiles. And me and a ton of other skilled people will be working to stop it happening in the cycle after that. Hardin's problem was that he didn't believe in people. He believed in systems and their ability to shape the world around them. Feng squeezes your shoulder. But as far as I'm concerned, people should be the ones running the systems, not the other way around. Anyway, Feng raps on the side of his terminal. I know you didn't come down here for a lecture. Yeah, the thing is, about my tracker, you remember my tracker, which we haven't talked about for <laughs> for weeks and weeks? Yeah, I haven't forgotten. He produces a thumbnail drive. I managed to finish that code solution I showed you. It's a modified ripper worm, one made to deactivate that tracker of yours. Uh, but in the extra time since I got back, I added a little something extra. Now, that tracker of yours doesn't just show SNARP where you are. It transmits data about the state of your body, your, your current condition. My worm won't just deactivate it, it'll edit that data to tell SNRP your body is irretrievably damaged, or irreparably damaged. DNR. Do not retrieve. He grins widely. Pretty smart, right? That's, yes, thank you. <laughs> just slot it already! You take the drive and hold it in your hand. Then you close your eyes and open up your access ports. Take down your defenses. The worm immediately enters your closed network. It whips through it, taking things with it as it goes. The moment they're gone, you forget they were ever there. They just blink out of existence. And a second later, it is done. You open your eyes. So how do you feel? asks Fang, a little nervously. Uh, honestly, dude, I'm tired. <laughs> Aren't we all? He pats you on the shoulder. Take it easy. Things might be a little woozy for a minute. He looks at his terminal screen. The logs tell me it worked, so feel it or not, you are free. Fang lets the word free hang in the air a little before he continues. It seems like it might be finally time for a celebration. Fang wraps his arm around you. You know, Jenna still owes us those drinks. He laughs and you join him. And later, when you leave, you feel deeply thankful for having such a friend. I was a little, I was a little distrustful, and I do feel... Remorseful is not exactly... It's not like I did anything about it, but you know. Listen, I was trying to keep myself safe. As you walk away from the building, you look up at the wide curve of the eye, up at the hub in the other rim beyond it. The whole thing twinkles with lights, and it seems impossible to see it as anything other than breathtakingly beautiful. It feels, in that moment, like something eternal. That doesn't mean it can, or even should, last forever or that it will never change, fade, or decay. It simply means that in this moment, this place has a future, and it is one that you know, deeply and truly, is worth protecting. Okay. So that's valuable. I'm a little bummed out that it, to see that it didn't kill this clock. I was kind of hoping that, um... Oh. Well, the clock's not present in here. Okay, it did. It did kill that clock. I was going to say, because, like, now that dude thinks we died. So, yeah, he should he should back off, uh, Ethan. Ethan, you just, you fucking hold on. Emphis, my dude. Okay. <sighs> should we deal with Ethan? What if I don't? 
You know, I've never not clicked on one of these things before. What do you reckon happens? He doesn't have his gun anymore, right? And this is at the compressor. The crew at the compressor likes me better than they like him. Ah, oh, I can't... I can't not click on it because I can't not know what it says. I need to... The compressor is almost empty when you enter. A couple of scattered patrons in the booths and a lone bartender. The bartender recognizes you immediately when you arrive and nods, and you return the greeting. You know already that you won't find Ethan here, but you had to be sure. With your tracker reporting you dead, he wouldn't have stuck around. You look at the empty stool, his empty stool, and you smile. You can imagine him on it when his slate chirps, letting him know that the target he was tracking is dead. You can imagine the screaming and the swearing, too. Is that all you were to Ethan? Another target? Or was there something else going on? It seems like a foolish question to ask now when he has fled the station, but it bothers you anyway. You take one last look and walk out. You doubt you will ever come back to this place or the memories it holds. <laughs> it's the nice, the nice way of the game saying we're going to take this note off the map entirely. You walk back out into the bright li into the lights of the bright market and allow yourself a smile. So this is what Feng meant when he said you were free. You could get used to this. And now we can bail off the station and SNR will be none the wiser, which is great news. All right, back to work on these sales. So we got a couple of interfaces here, pretty easy. We're also making okay money at this because we keep uh, we keep tripping the plus five cryo thing. Uh, let's go ahead and re-roll these. Okay, pretty great news. And then we just engineer with these two. Well, the middle option on engineer gives you only plus one point, right? So actually. I should see if we can if we can get lucky and pull a positive here. Huh? Not so lucky. Alright, well, how about a positive here? Either one of them coming up good is good enough. <laughs> Damn it. Okay, we did pull a piece of scrap though. That's pretty lucky. In its own way. <laughs> it's a little bit a little bit different from what I was hoping. I will say, I think that text is like a little inappropriate because was he able to track us still with him no longer having the contract? I mean, I guess he must have been able to. All right, two more days on that. Uh, jam this scrap component in here. And I think this coming cycle is gonna be, it's gonna be very good for us. So is that clock gone? That clock is gone. Whew, beautiful. Feng was very single-minded, but he came through eventually. So let's go ahead and kill this. We can we can throw our four at this. Scrap component? Ah, no such luck. The atmosphere in the airlock is euphoric. You and Bliss keep grinning at each other like idiots. Exhausted, blinded, sore, aching idiots. Sleeper, that was incredible. She punches you on the arm. I never thought we were going to make it. Those idiots tangled the whole thing up like nothing I've ever seen. Yeah, well, we make a good team. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm going to be, try to let, I'm going to try to be less bristly with people. <laughs> Bliss smiles a winning smile. As the, as the lock's inner door clunks open, Moritz gives a rare whoop. He looks exhausted, too, and for good reason. Moritz has been the one ferrying tools and parts back and forth from the ship. His tired smile tells you he's glad it's done. Sleeper. Bliss. He shakes his head. Impressive. When I saw that ship come in, I thought there was no way. Why, thank you, Moritz, for believing in us. Moritz rolls his eye. You know what I mean. Take the compliment. He shoulders some of the gear that came back in with you, and Bliss, uh, 
came back in with you and Bliss, and heads to the racks to stow it. Bliss turns to you. I think you should be the one to do the honors. She nods to the ragged-looking console that Moritz assembled. I don't want to jinx it. She smiles, but you can see she's genuinely nervous. Okay, I, I got it. It's fine. I'll check the console. You glide over to the console and check the screen. It takes a second to see what you're doing through the flickering, cracked display, but after a moment, you see the accounts. And there it is, almost a thousand cryo sitting in the base transfer account. Well, Bliss calls. Have we been screwed again? It's there. Bliss kicks off from the floor and spins up into the bay, shouting as she does. The noise takes Moritz by surprise, and he knocks a rack of parts, scattering handfuls of metal fixings across the bay. The sight is something. Glinting steel catching the work lights like glitter. <laughs> Sorry, says Bliss, grinning when she comes back down. I needed that. She kicks off and joins you at the terminal. Moritz even managed to sell that produce. We made a tidy profit. Eventually. She laughs. Here. She loads a stack of blank chits into the terminal and transfers a chunk of the cryo to them. This is your cut. Bliss hands you the chits. Thank you for believing in this place. She looks away and smiles. Even when I couldn't. And when you first met me, I was on the edge of giving up. All it would have taken was just, uh, one more push. But now, now this place is sparking again. Work is coming in, there are funds in the accounts. Even Moritz has a spring in his step. You both look over at him, hap happily racking up tools. And that's because of you. She punches you on the arm. You know, he likes you. Yeah, he's a good kid. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say what's his deal. This, this feels like it might be leading somewhere. What? Why is he always so quiet? She frowns. Mm, I'm not so sure. He doesn't much like to talk about himself, that one. She leans in closer. You know, he came here looking to rob the place. I gave him a job instead. Don't don't tell him I told you that, though. I just, I just thought it might help you understand the kid. Moritz turns to look at you, and both Bliss and you awkwardly wave. <laughs> Maybe it's time to change the subject. So, are you going to be okay? <laughs> Me? Always. She looks away. And from here on out, it's going to be a little easier. I'm going to look for some component contracts, stuff that'll keep us inside the bay, not out in the black. You know, no, re no need to risk our necks if we don't need to. You want to cash out? That's fine. But there'll always be work, here for, work for you here when you need it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I'm not going to make a promise that I don't know for sure that I'm going to keep. She smiles and then, out of nowhere, quickly gives you a hug. She steps back and glances around reflexively. Uh, t take care, she says softly. You too. She turn, uh, You turn to leave. And sleeper. Yeah? She smiles. Don't spend that all at once. Okay. An upgrade point and 300 cryo. Uh, so we're like, we were already real good on resources, but like we're really, really good on resources. Oh, interesting. Moritz has heard Bliss speaking with someone remotely. Is there another job coming in? So there is some like, just some low scale garbage to do, but I guess this is gonna, in six days, there's gonna be something occurring. Well, here's what I think. Let us go and wrap the, um, wrap this up. We can just throw our three in here. That'll be good enough. Your crew slowly filters out of the shipyard locker room, the bubbling chatter reducing with each group that leaves. There's excitement in the air. Havenage just made an announcement. The assembly teams are done. Sitting on the locker room bench, you can feel the sidereal out there, its hulking mass now intimately familiar to you. Over the past cycles, you have watched it grow and be assembled. You have walked through its veins and welded its bones. Now it is ready for the final stage. It'll go to testing now, and then enter a final process of sealing and resealing, checking and rechecking before it is deemed suitable for its generational trip. But for now, your work is done, and you can't help but feel proud. A cough interrupts your thoughts. It's Lem, changing out of his work gear, Mina nowhere to be seen. He smiles. She'll be ready soon. 
Uh, yes, I know. I, I was just, I was just thinking about that. That's exciting. Although, if you think about it, we're all out of a job now. He quickly adds, no, not that I'm complaining. He comes to sit beside you on the bench. She's got to be in her best shape when she carries you, Mina, and me out of here. It's... What would I even mean by this? I'm not so sure. Like, I'm not so sure I'm going. I'm gonna... I'm gonna say... Oh, so confident? Lem smiles apologetically. Why not? I figure I'm due a lucky turn by now. That is dangerous thinking, my dude. He rubs his hands nervously. No use in wondering what if until the draw anyway. There's a few cycles until then. Lem is right, but the odds seem unlikely anyway. How many are working in the shipyard? Hundreds? A thousand? Now, you've certainly seen more faces than you than you can count pass through. And are the Silas Foundation even going to keep their promise? Out here, on the eye, you get the sense that no one would hold them to it. Why else would they be building the sidereal in a surrogate system? As you think, Lem watches you with a worried look. Hey, Lem, tell me about Silas. The Foundation, he thinks. Well, I'm not sure I know much more than you. I hear they have a planet in mind for the sidereal, something temperate and habitable. I think they're run by some rich folk from the core, people interested in doing things different. Different how, though? Lem looks into space. Well, I guess they don't like the way the core runs things. All these surrogate systems like this one feeding resources into their silos. It's a pyramid of sorts, and we're on the bottom layer. I guess Silas wants to change that. I'd rather keep my mind on the prize, so to speak. I don't much care what they're for or against, as long as they can help us get out of here. He sighs. Have you ever been in a thunderstorm sleeper? A real big one? Uh, I think I don't remember. I think that, you know, we've, we've already established that a bunch of the memories from the life of the person who we were branched off of are not available to us, so I, I don't remember. Lem shoots you a worried look for a moment. Oh, it's something else, he smiles. The sound, the smell, the rain hammering down, the whole sky stretched out and bruised, roaring and huge. Uh, the place I was born, New Pembroke, dry old rock in a Conway system, had two seasons. One of them was dry as a bone, dusty, ugly. The other was one long storm. It was a side effect of the terraforming efforts, they said. Rain used to rattle off the roofs like bullets, wash the dust away, turn the streets into rivers. It'd sing us to sleep and wake us in the morning. We'd wait half a year just to see it again. The best day was the one where the first drops fell. He sniffs. Some days I wake up swearing I can hear it again. You know, I was thinking. Mina's never seen a storm, never even felt rain. And she's grown up here, the ring, her only horizon, always in the dark. I want to change that for her. And you will. I, whatever I have to do, <laughs> you will. Of course, almost there. Lem stands, stretching. Well, I best get back to the little one anyway. With the shifts done, I reckon she'll be happy to have me home for a few cycles. He shoulders his gear. See you in a few for the draw? Yeah, I'll, I'll be there. Right on. He grins. Lem leaves, making you the last person in the cavernous locker room. As you sit, you think about rain, and a little, a little hope creeps in. Is it possible? Could the sidereal really take you to a planet? A place with weather, with skies... With life? You get up quickly before you can think about it anymore. Mm, it's too soon to hope. Too dangerous. And there's work to be done. Yeah, hope... Honestly, at this point in my life, hope spooks me. <laughs> okay, six days. Well, then I don't know that we have anything of terrible import here... Uh, to do. Oh no, wait. Three days till the draw... Six days till it leaves? Is that what the deal is? Okay, yeah. Three days to the draw, six days till it leaves. Tomorrow is the day when we pull the, um... Tomorrow's the day when we, when whatever it is that's going to happen with the gardener's seed happens. I'm gonna buy some scrap. 
Or I'm not going to buy some scrap. I mean, this is crossed out. I guess we're not allowed to... Oh, because... Sorry. This is not full. But... We had bought scrap. I guess this... this Should this be showing full? I don't remember. I, I think it should. I think we had bought scrap because that was the scrap that we just ate. All right, so never mind then. Uh, we certainly don't need stabilizer. Now we do have some dice left and I don't really know what to do with them. We could go work for Rabaya, which I'm like, uh, I'm a little, I, I do not think I actually want to do. We just go work over here. I don't think we have anything that's going to actually like advance any clocks or stories, but we could put the dice to some kind of use. Just generate a little energy or something. Because, like, these dice are basically throwaways, right? Here, let me re-roll them. Collect some spores? Who knows? Maybe we'll need more spores. Am I allowed to... Okay, we are still allowed to germinate. So I am pretty curious. I kind of want to do this... Because, again, I want to see what happens if you take an energy hit when you have no energy. Okay, we got really lucky there. I guess we can just start this clock again. There's no reason not to. Even if we don't get use out of what we grow, somebody will, right? Uh, and then... Okay, so two club head caps makes stabilizer. It's a good reason to keep that clock running. And you know what? I'm just going to throw this one in the work assignment. Engaging with other people in the commune, doing my level best to, like, be a member of the community here. I do wish that I had a piece of scrap, but we're fine. We'll be fine. We'll probably be fine. It's it's probably fine. <laughs> All right. Well, those are pretty good dice. Let it, let us see what is up. Rico has something in her hands when you enter the lab. It looks like a knotted twist of woody stems, a ring about the circumference of a human head consisting of a single stalk at one side and a branched woven network at the other. As you approach, she holds it up, and in the lights of the lab, it looks like... a crown. Rico finishes your thought. She smiles and shakes her head in disbelief. Sorry, is that what grew? It is. I came to the plant this morning, and this loop was all that was there. She points to a lump on the edge of the ring. The seed grew right back into itself, twisted up out of the soil. That being you encountered, in the cloud as you call it, was it wearing one of these? She eyes you suspiciously, still unsure if she is somehow embroiled in an overlong prank. It would be a very impressive prank, right? Uh, well it doesn't quite work like that. She sighs. Uh, perhaps wearing was the wrong word. She places the object on the bench and shuffles to her analysis terminal, her face lit by its amber light in the dim corner of the lab. Well, it isn't exactly a plant, anyway. Not from what I can tell. She gives you a serious look. No leaves, no chloroplasts, just a series of filaments encased in cellulose walls. Filaments? Wait, what kind of filaments? See, that's why I like you, sleeper. You are so good at spotting the unusual details. She beckons you over. Look at this. You see a cross-section scan of the crown, its layers of plant-like structure on full view, until you reach the center. There, instead of xylem and phloem for transporting nutrients, something branched and woven glints. Yeah, this is what I was thinking. Like, we either grew, we either grew like a cable, or maybe it's an antenna? Are those wires? She laughs. I'm not sure whether to say yes or no here. 
I mean, they're not wires like those in an electrical system, no, but they are filaments of a conductive material, so... Yes? She leans closer to the screen. But, but you see these branches? They remind me of dendrites, of neurons. She rubs her eyes. Which is, frankly, ridiculous. Are we growing a brain for, like, a physical form for the gardener to inhabit? You look back at the crown on the table as Rico fusses over the scans, and you suddenly realize what it reminds you of. You remember signing the forms, the walk to the sleeper tanks, the cold metal floor. Then you remember the crown they fitted you with, the branching structure of wires and pads. No, not a crown. They called it an interface. The tool of your emulation, your transference from neurons to electrons. An interface. That is your gift from Gardner. You turn back to Rico. Uh, well, it's, it's an interface. Rico looks at you puzzled, but then something clicks in her mind. Perhaps something she heard from the sleeper she had helped all those cycles ago. She starts talking, partly to you, partly to herself. Oh. If the club heads were made for you, then, then this, too, could be made for you, for your frame. She shuffles over quickly to the interface, a word that has stuck to this strange branched object quickly in your mind. You're right. That entity, it is the entity I've been looking for. She shuffles quickly to the crown. They are the entity which is controlling the Greenway, which has been maintaining it, supporting it, guiding it for all these decades. She stops to catch her breath. And they want to talk with you. Rico leads you to a seat. I, I will be here, sleeper. If something happens, if you wish me to remove the crown, the, the interface, just squeeze. She grips your hand tightly. You meet her eyes, clouded with age, but bright with the thrill of new discoveries. Then she places the interface on your head and everything blinks out. Back into the river, back into the dark flow. But something is different now. I think it is largely going to function as an antenna. You are no longer pushed, no longer blocked and buffeted by the swarm, by the storm. Instead, it flows around you. You move and it parts, letting you pass. Something else resists, but it gives easily enough. You look back and see your body. You've left it behind. Somewhere, Rico's voice is talking to you, asking you questions. It is excited, eager, desperate to know what lies on the other side, what the entity has to say to you. You realize how long she has waited for this moment, for the moment of meeting between the inhabitants of the Greenway and its protector, and yet she is still on the outside. You shake off the sadness. You will be her eyes. And then you see the figure, Gardner, out in the storm, planting. It takes less than a moment to reach them. You have never felt so free. This is how Navigator must have felt, released from their prison. This, you think, is what it feels like to be in the place you were built to inhabit. Gardner does not turn at your approach. They go on planting, but their voice whispers in the waters like a sharply rising current. You grew the gift, their speech hisses around you. Good. I am glad. I wanted to meet, to meet you. Then we are the same, both eager shoots seeking one another. How does it feel to be free of your seed? That mm, Okay. <clears throat> they stoop to plant again. I'm going to not push any further on that. Uh, good. It feels, it feels good. <laughs> At the cyborg equivalent of an orchiectomy. <laughs> that is good. They press a seed into the loamy depths. There was some disagreement, continues Gardner, as if you were picking up on a long-held conversation, with the others. They felt you were a danger, but they are always cautious, especially the fungi. They like old loam, known knowns, wide and stable networks. Sorry, the, the fungi were cautious. 
Mostly, yes, though there are many among their number who favor short growth cycles, thick nutrient veins, and sudden shifts. He gestures out into the storm, and though you cannot see them, you feel presences all around, sensing this audience with great interest. After all, they understood that it was I who made them their crowns, and without them they would not have joined the chorus. So they see that it is only fair that you get your chance to join, too. You made more crowns. I made them all. Gardener moves away a little, looking for another planting spot. It was so lonely here, but before long I found them and began to let them in. Gardner stoops again. We are millions, and we grow. I hope you understand. I am unused to speaking to your kind. It has been many cycles since my last conversation. I think it was with Chief Executive Trellick himself. You look around and you see it. Every growing thing, every non-human being in the Greenway is here. They are networked, connected, branched, and linked by this strange being, this artifact of the old station. Trellick. Trellick is, um... We know this name. Was Trellick the name that we got... Like, is Trellick the person above Rabia, the person Rabia works for? That would be weird, right? Chief executive... Well, I guess he's maybe a chief executive in the Yadigan, or... Hmm. I don't know. Maybe it will be worth pursuing her plot. I certainly have unanswered questions. I just don't want to shake people down. It feels very out of place for us. The impossible dream of a senile farm administration AI. A living network. You could dissolve here, you realize free of that decaying body. You wouldn't need to be a person. Why would you, among all these other minds? You turn away from Gardner for a moment and look back at your body. A tiny hairline thread connects it to you. You still hear Rico's voice again, still asking, still checking in. Are you okay, Sleeper? What, what are they saying, Sleeper? Are you still there, Sleeper? Something in you sighs a long sigh, a sigh that speaks of an exhaustion beyond tiredness, an exhaustion rooted deep inside you. It stems from the effort of answering questions, of answering problems, of getting up and breathing each cycle. But something else resists the sigh, a yearning, a sense of distance, a desire to squeeze that hand that holds you for its warmth, its blood, its complexity to make a gesture that says, I'm still here, I'm still alive, I'm with you. The two ideas spin within you, making you nauseous. If you break that thread, you will be free, free to dissolve here, to grow strange and beautiful among a million others. If you follow it, if you squeeze Rico's hand, you will wake up back in that dying body with all the pain and warmth that entails. Now is the moment to choose. Ah. Uh, okay, here's the thing. I actually really like this as a, a... What I assume is an ending, right? This is a way that we, as our... Um, as the sleeper, can break from this body that represents the way that we've been tethered to this heartless capitalist system. And we can just, like, as we're sort of, like, growing into the idea of taking community, this is the most community. <laughs> I think it makes a lot of sense. However, I also really think we need to... I don't want to not give Lem every possible chance to pull a ticket on the horizon, you know? So I'm not going to break the thread, and I'm hoping that we can come back here and and do it later. But I'm worried that now is the moment to choose is telling me that this is like a permanent thing. 
I can't imagine any reason why we wouldn't be able to come back later. This is the ending I think we should take. I just don't think I'm ready yet. So I'm going to follow the thread back home. Your eyes track the thread across the whirling dark, back to your body. Shit. <laughs> Shit, and also fuck. This choice, you realize, will not be presented again. I gotta... We gotta do what we can for Lem, right? I mean, for me, for Mina, really, but... Here's my concern. Are we going to have another, like, I guess, I guess at this point with our tracker turned off, we could just live on the eye? Probably. But I don't, hmm. I'm following it because I'm doing this for Lemon Mina. Yeah, okay. I really, the, the thing that's frustrating about this is that this is the right ending. This is exactly where we should end up. We should... We should sink into the station, into the place, into the greenery, and become part of it, and integrate with a system that, like, a system that is a person, to use Feng's sort of clumsy language. And I think it makes so much sense for us narratively. But, I mean, this is interesting, too, that we had to turn away from the thing that is, like, that is the right, the next step in the direction we are moving in order to save someone else. And, like, in a very real sense, that's also us allowing our ourselves to be subsumed into community, right? It's kind of it's kind of more beautiful for the consequence. It's the thing that most video games are just playing too cowardly to uh, to uh, to to attempt. You don't look back at Gardner. You don't dare risk it. Instead, you follow the thread delicately, carefully, like a diver following their lifeline back to the surface. The river whirls around you, but it doesn't pull. It isn't jealous. Neither does it understand. It is, after all, just a river. It isn't a person, a flesh and blood person, with wants, with desires, with capacity for love and hate. It doesn't understand you, and you don't understand it. So you don't focus on it. You don't think about it, on what feels like such a long journey back through the dark. You set your mind on eyes instead, on hands, things you can focus on, hold on to. And then, after an age of crossing, you are there, settling back into the chair, into a body in a chair, and the overwhelming sensations that come with being a living thing with a rich and detailed sensorium. For a moment, you feel like you have made a terrible mistake. Who would choose this weight, this anxiety, this deep well at the center of existence? But then you feel it. Rico's hand, gripped hard around yours, trembling a little, sweating a little. Rico's hand with its brittle bones and crumpled skin. Rico's hand. And in that moment, you understand why you made this choice. And then you squeeze Rico's hand, and you wake up. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a deep existential terror. Oh! Oh! That was also an ending. I guess that is, that is, we, we chose to stay here on the station and sort of like, but shit, I really wanted to conclude the Lemon Mina plot line. <laughs> there was one day left until the draw. Okay. I mean, I'm actually really curious to see if, if after the credits, cause like, we'll still be on the station, but like, oh man. So this is the thing that, um, I talked about this idea a little bit at the end of Deathloop. Uh, cause Deathloop, not to spoil things too much, I'm going to talk about it in a very abstract sense here. Deathloop is a game that ends at the end of the story that it's telling, not at the end of the events of that character's life, which is not, you know, video games have a tendency to have one particular shape of narrative. Uh, and it's often the wrong shape for the story they're telling, which I think is why a lot of video game storytelling feels so weird and stilted. This is exactly like... This is exactly that same thing. This is exactly the conflict that is at the heart of this story was sort of resolved, and now we've... 
Now we've made a place for ourselves and we've accepted our body as our body and sort of like taken, taken the merge to this is the being that we will be. Um, and it's, I, it's beautiful. I think it's be, it's it's a better story for ending where it should end, but also, but also there is that hanging thread. Sleeper, Rico's voice comes wavering through the dark. Are you still with me? Okay, so there is. We are allowed to keep playing. That was like the end of our story, though, right? That's what the credits mean. You sit up, the lab a bright green glare that fades as you gather yourself. Or it's like the end of a story. Our story is, that's a, that's language that is a little messy here. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm here. Rico smiles. Good. She squeezes your hand. I thought you'd left me for a moment. What? She pauses. Who? <sighs> Tell me about it. Tell me everything. I feel like I should tell her... I feel like I should tell her... So so given the, given the weird dichotomy here, I feel like we should tell her at least some of the truth. She should understand what the deal is with the gardener. And so that means we're picking this option. However, given sort of a, more of a spectrum of results... I'm not sure if I would choose to tell her about the fact that he offered to let me, or that the, the collective effectively offered to let me dissolve into them. And I'm talking about it as like an appropriate ending. And a lot of the text is referring to it as like sort of a, a loss, but there is like, there's a deep existential terror to the eye of allowing, to the idea of allowing yourself to be dissolved into a structure like that. Right. That I'm just sort of brushing past, um, I don't know. It's terrifying, but I do think it still feels like probably the way we would have gone if people here didn't still need us. So I'm going to tell her the truth. You tell Rico everything. You tell her about the gardener, that strange farm administrator AI that has grown to be so much more. About the chorus, that impossible configuration of networked plants. And finally, about the choice that the gardener offered you. She listens attentively, but her responses are hard to read, and you wonder if she might have made a different decision had she been in your place. Thank you, Sleeper, for telling me. I know it isn't easy to say such things. People so often do not wish to hear strange truths. She looks away. And thank you for returning to me, though I know you had your own reasons. She squeezes your hand reassuringly. Something passes between you, then. A kind of shared sadness for the impossible choice. The choice to escape your body, or to stay and suffer it. Her smile is warm and generous, and whatever the wisdom of your choice, you are glad to feel welcome in this moment, in this place. Then, suddenly, she stands and walks a little away, as if trying to escape an unpleasant thought. You worry that she knows all too well what it takes to make a choice like you did. Rico sighs. So, Sleeper, do you plan to stay in the commune with us? Yeah, you know what? I, I think I do. I wish I understood better the mechanical import of the question she's asking here. Maybe I'll say for a while, because I don't want to, like... I, this is This is honest enough, right? This is... It's a little non-committal, but it's the truth. I'm glad to hear it. Rico crosses back over, uh, back over to you and takes one of your hands in both of hers. Haifa needs new blood if it wants to survive. And she squeezes. You are a good friend. The feeling is mutual. Slowly, my roots growing outward. <laughs> well, don't let me keep you. Rico waves you away and limps back to her terminal. As she does, you notice the crown in her hand, and she places it on the bench with great care. You can't help but feel a little curious about what she intends to do with it. My read is that the thought that she was trying to escape was she gave serious consideration to putting on the crown, and like what she would, if it would work for her, what she would do in that place, 
and probably encountered that sort of that moment of existential terror. I don't know. I can't imagine it would work for her, right? It works for me because my brain is essentially, my brain has Wi-Fi, but I don't know. Then you are out, breathing the fresh air of the greenway as if it was a spring morning. The dappled light makes a patchwork of the greening landscape and you walk into it, sensing the movements of the gardener's chorus all around. And you are glad to be here, in this strange and beautiful place, a little longer. There's something about the idea of... I guess I have two two major sort of like categories of thoughts that I'm wrestling with in my head right now, and I'm not going to reach a satisfactory conclusion about either of them in the next 10 minutes. But just like to vocalize where, where my head's at right now. Um, first of all, there's something that's very resonant with my own experiences of transition and stuff about like having to choose your body and decide to live in it and like without getting too heavy you know obviously I didn't have the choice of being welcomed into a communal being but like I don't know maybe I don't want to tell that story the trans people in the audience already know what I was gonna say I bet um <clears throat> anyway the other thing I'm thinking is that it's really interesting how we, like, from a standpoint of understanding art, understanding, like, the form of art, formalism, I guess, it's really interesting how we use the credits to signify things and what it means for there to be a credit sequence in a story where there is still more story, right? And especially sort of, like, in the, like, to some extent, the form of, I don't know, I was about to babble about Marvel movies and some shit, but, like, that idea is not really new. What Marvel movies are doing is just what comic books have been doing for 30 years, except, you know, more expensively. Um, I don't know. I'm going to spend the rest of my day, I think, thinking about that credit sequence there and what that really means Especially for a story like this one, an interactive story that you have to, like, actively engage with. It's very interesting. Um, we should... Yeah, we have we have a little bit of time left in the episode. Let's... Why would I do that? What am I doing? <laughs> Let's go... I really want to handle the Lemon Mina thing. And then after we do that, I guess we're done? Because, like... I think we kind of reached an ending to our story. We're going to stay on the on the station. It's just that since we chose to stay on the station, we have the uh, we are afforded the ability to sort of like um, wrap things up. So we could pursue this Rabia thing, but honestly, I'm like pretty. I'm pretty uncomfortable with working with yet again. If we're going to stay here, maybe it's most important to... If we're planning to stay on the, the eye indefinitely, maybe it is most important to understand what is going on here. Also, I don't know how else we would pursue whatever happened to Sabine. If Sabine was just going to show up in our life and like grab us out of an alleyway, it would have happened by now, right? I'm going to go on patrol. I feel really uncomfortable with collecting tithes, even though collect the reward for collecting tithes is super good for us. And I don't, I don't want to do it. But we'll do a little bit of patrol. You know what? I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw one collect tithes here. Because I'm actually really curious if it does um, result in faster progress on the clock. Ugh. <sighs> I don't know. This is a lot of dice to burn if we're just going to be able to get the results, like, one at a time. Tithes, in, tithes of good or services must be collected in exchange for protection and administration. 
<sighs> Structurally, I guess th there are ways in which this is not that different from a union. It's just a matter of exactly what these words mean in reality. Let's go see. One mechanic tithes the new filtration system for the block's atrium, and after you help install it, he offers you some of the remaining scrap. Okay, so he's tithing a system, like a, a, a part to help people without receiving payment for that part, but like the thing that's happening here is something that's good for everybody. That actually does make me feel considerably better. And we're going to get the same text here, right, if we pull another positive. Okay, on a neutral, it's just plus energy. Among the craftsmen and merchants, you visit a chef who insists on feeding you and the other enforcers a rich stew of his own recipe. And it's not even poisoned, we hope. I'm going to throw this three in there as well, because I'm just curious. I'd love to get another scrap component. Okay, we got we got chef thing again. I mean that fills us up. If we'd gotten another scrap component, obviously we could have um we could have what do you call it? Uh repaired ourselves up to have five dice for tomorrow. So I guess we're gonna do this for one more day, just work with yet again, because we don't have anything else of terrible import to do while we wait for the drawing. And then we're going to oops, that's the wrong thing. And then we're just going to see what happens. So consuming a scrap component right now doesn't get us anything. We'll just wrap the day. Oh, I have a bunch of upgrade points that I don't really know what I want to do with. We have four, in fact. Am I a thrill seeker? I don't know. I don't know if we're making all that movement. I, I'm going to just hold these, I guess. Hard to kill seems um, borderline useless. And I don't feel like we should advance engage anymore. We got we got to plus zero. That's like, you know, normal person levels of engagement. So I guess we'll just hold these until we know for sure that we need a plus two to one of the other skills. I'm going to throw a five in here. So we'd have to get three scrap components now to be able to repair ourselves to five dice. Might be able to. We don't need the plus three energy. Okay, I'm really good at rolling neutrals. Wow, our luck. It's really something. Okay, we got a positive, but because we only got one positive out of those four dice that were all basically coin flips, we still can't go back to five, uh, five, uh, five uh, condition, five dice. What is this? Because we didn't fill that bar, did we? I stopped looking at it, but I don't think the bar filled. As you say your goodbyes to the other enforcers and walk back through the low end, a chirruping catches your attention. In a quiet corridor away from the main thoroughfares, someone has stuck a small recorder to the wall with suit sealant tape. Written across the fluorescent tape is one word. Sleeper. You peel it away from the wall, and as you do, it triggers some kind of improvised trip switch and explodes the end. <laughs> Sleeper. Sabine's voice crackles through. I have seen you with Yadigan members. Are they holding you captive now, too? A high whine. I am sorry if I have dragged you into this. Do not trust them. Something is happening within the gang. Some kind of power struggle. You cover the speaker a little, their voice too loud in the quiet corridor. I will come soon. Thanks to your efforts, I have located most of their properties. At the right time, a pause. I will see you soon. Don't give up. Remember our deal. The recording cuts out. You stare at the recorder, processing what you have just heard. Hearing Sabine's voice again opens up something inside of you. An s and Arp employee... Do they know that I know? You struggle with a mix of concern and distrust. Yes, yes I do, basically always. You throw the recorder into a nearby waste chute as you leave the corridor, still unsure who to trust, and head quietly out of the low end. So did that 
actually start a new clock, or do we need to finish yet again Insider? My guess is we probably have to finish yet again Insider to see the end of that, but it probably doesn't matter a huge amount right now because tomorrow's the drawing, right? Yeah. So that's my first concern. It's really interesting that it's three days between the drawing and leaving. Like, I wonder if you actually will have anything that you can do that will be, like, relevant to the, uh, to the thing in that time. Well. So we can hang out at four dice for a while, thanks to our scrap components, and then we can stabilize when we're about to actually fall to three. That could be the move. And we're about to be able to harvest a new set of mushrooms, so we might get enough club heads for a new stabilizer. And I think that will be our sort of like the way we live on the station. The gardener will keep feeding us stabilizer and yeah, we've got ourselves like a little life here now. The crowds have already gathered by the time you get to the shipyard and you recognize faces among them, people you have worked alongside on the sidereal. The intervening cycles have turned their excitement to anxiety and few of them smile at you. Instead, the nervous energy of the crowd fills the space creating a feedback loop of growing tension. You pick out Lem and Mina and work your way over to them, pushing through the crowd. He silently raises his eyebrows at you, his anxiety obvious, but Mina flashes you a huge smile, unaware of the tension. Robot, she calls out, reaching out to you. Yeah, of course, give her a hug. She gratefully accepts your hug, leaning against your chest, and Lem smiles, seemingly glad to share the weight of Mina for a moment. So here's the thing. If we actually do both get tickets and we, we both are able to go, I don't know what I would do. I've been operating on the assumption that the narrative will not be so kind to us this whole time, but I don't know that that's what's going to happen. And who knows? Maybe it actually is a raffle. Like maybe it's maybe it's actually randomly determined. Hmm. I guess we'll come to that. Uh, we'll cross that bridge if we come to it. Quite the turnout, huh? Lem glances around, pulling Mina close. I don't think patience is one of this crowd's strengths. The sound of an argument toward the back catches your, your and Lem's attention. He's putting it lightly. This place seems set to explode. Yeah, this is not good. Lem doesn't dare answer, but the look in his eyes suggests he agrees. This is Aster Engharth, Engharth of the Celis Foundation. The announcement echoes from the speakers at the shipyard entrance, and shouts of quiet rapidly follow. Yeah, what is going to happen when most of the people in here do not, like, get the official news that they do not have a place to go? I'm sorry I can't be there to meet you all, and thank you, on behalf of Sendracellus, for the work you have done on the sidereal horizon. Most of the crowd strains to see Aster's face, but the small display shows only a ghostly white figure, smudged and unclear. Sendra wanted me to pass on her personal thanks for your commitment to and belief in the Celis Foundation's mission. We chose the eye for this project because we knew that we would find like-minded individuals here, especially among the ranks of the Venerable Havenage Association. Unlike most of the Corps, we neither believe Erlin's eye to be a threat or a rogue state, but instead an embryo for the formation of a new, decentralized social structure one where each citizen might be the master of their own destiny. Mmm. A ripple of impatience runs through the crowd. They didn't come here for a sermon. You are all pioneers, just like those core citizens who the sidereal horizon will carry, in cryosleep, to the planet that will become the Foundation's first frontier world, Celis One. At the mention of the destination world, excited conversations break out among the workers. There, our citizens will be able to create their own innovative bottom-up economic order, aligned with the principles set down by Sundra Sellis herself. Freedom, resilience, and self-sustenance. This is all thanks to your tireless efforts in the Havenage Yards. I am getting a little bit nervous at the way that this is crafted. As a reward for, our, for those efforts, you may know that we are offering a select group the opportunity to join the caretakers of this vision, the staff of the Sidereal Horizon, who will maintain the vessel during its multi-decade transit through interstellar space. Lem turns to you, his eyes bright. This is it. 
the draw has been performed at random by the central AIs of the Foundation and is final and binding. Please note only licensed contractors of the Foundation are eligible for this draw. I know you all have been eagerly awaiting this day, and without further, ID, uh, without further delay, I will now read the Celis identification numbers of those chosen for this great honor. Yeah, a murmur runs through the crowd. Celis identification numbers? Licensed contractors? You've never even heard the term mentioned. Is this something you were supposed to be assigned? You glance at Lem, but his eyes are fixed forward, wide and shimmering. All around you, people are speaking in hushed tones, like a rising wave. Aster starts reading out sequences of numbers and letters, and panic begins to set in. No one seems to know what is happening. Somewhere near the front of the crowd, someone shouts in celebration, and everyone pushes forward. Uh, except me, I do not participate in the press. Lem? You, s you turn to see Lem still staring forward. Mina is scared now as the shouts start. Daddy? Someone throws something at the entrance and it rattles against the shipyard doors. You see, for the first time, Havenage security standing on either side, scared, arguing between themselves. You feel the anger rising in the crowd. Lem, we should go. He doesn't move. I I'm just... They, they might call out names. I, I, I can't. Mina tugs at his dog tags. No, dude, it is not happening. We cannot be here for this. Lem blinks rapidly, then turns to you. He opens and closes his mouth and looks down at Mina. He sees the fear in her eyes and understands. It's time to go. As you lead Lem and Mina out, shoving people... Or, sorry, you lead Lem and Mina out, shoving people aside. As you do, you hear the sound of scuffles emerging at the front of the crowd, of metal canisters bouncing off the shipyard walls. You keep your head down and walk away, the sound of Aster reading off the ciphers echoing above the chaos like some strange mantra. Mantra is, I think, the real pronunciation of that word. When you turn to Lem, there are tear tracks running down his cheeks, and Mina is sniffling into his jacket. You feel the sadness rising in you, too. They screwed you. They screwed all of you. You were never even on the list. The feeling is as unpleasant as it is familiar. You stare ahead into the tunnel as the security sirens sound out, a signal for the coming violence. Shit and also shit. Well... Ship's still here for another three days. I mean, what are we gonna do? There's a note on the door of the unit. Sleeper, gone to find work, Lem. So what we do is we hang out for three more days, I guess, and we... I am now invested. This is the thing that is the rest of the game for me. We have to find a way to take care of Mina. And Lem, but especially Mina. I think this is where we're going to call it for today. And thank you all so much for watching. I am still finding this game really fascinating. I'm, I'm really curious to see where it's going to go from here. I mean, I should have known. Right, we all we all should have known. <laughs> the thing is, you can't trust the. F mm, okay, I'm not gonna get off on some very long anti-capitalist rant right now. Right at this moment, I'm gonna end the episode at this moment. <laughs> when you come back next time, maybe that rant while we play out three more cycles here on the eye, and then we try our very best to figure out how to make sure Lem and Mina are provided for, and we'll see you then. <laughs>